All right. Need to turn phones on silent if you haven't done so already. I'm setting a bad example here. All right, so this evening, I, I kind of want, I, I'm really excited, obviously, I, I can't, I think I've said that a few times already about this church being here, and I know you all are as well, so I'm, I was spending basically both sermons kind of talking about Stronghold Baptist Church, and one thing I just want to, I just want to bring up, because I didn't specifically mention it this morning, I was talking about who we are as a church, and what we believe, and kind of the fundamentals, and if you notice, some of the things I didn't bring up, because I was trying to focus on things that are just this is a deal breaker if you know like if you, if you don't believe these things I kind of want to be clear on some really really fundamental foundational doctrines you know regarding salvation and, and who God is and things like that just to just to be very very upfront and clear about that but there's obviously other doctrines that we believe that this church holds to you know I, I notice I didn't bring up the the post-trib or pre-trib rapture or like who Israel is but I mean we believe that the the tribulation is going, you know, the, the saints are going to go through tribulation. We believe that there's going to be a, a rapture of the saints that's going to happen after the Antichrist is revealed and after Christians are going through persecution uh, before God pours out His wrath. We don't believe that modern day Israel are any special chosen people that God has appointed and they get some free pass into heaven or anything like that. We believe they need Christ just as much as every other unbeliever does. And uh, But we don't believe that there's any special deep that goes on with them because they're physically the seed of Abraham. That that means nothing. So I just wanted to bring up a couple of those things. Uh, just, I didn't really clear clarify that very well this morning. But um, what I really want to focus on tonight is the fortifying strong stronghold Baptist Church. Let, let's really make this church solid and strengthened. And I'm going to start off just by talking about why this church even exists. This church exists because of all of you. Everyone that's here today, this is this you you are the reason why this church is here right now. We want to strengthen this church and really get things going. Now I rarely address the internet in my preaching. Okay, I very rarely do this because what's most important for a church is what the church needs to hear. I'm preaching to you. I'm here, I'm here as a minister of God, as, as a, a pastor, to pastor this flock and, and to preach the things that I think are necessary from God's Word that everybody here needs to, needs to hear and, and be aware of. But the only times I'll ever address like the internet is if I think it's still valuable for people here. And so bringing up the fact that this church exists because of you is going to be valuable not just for you to understand but for everyone else out there that is looking and wanting another church to exist in their area. So for those of you that don't know, the reason why me and my family, why I chose to move here to start the church is because of you. Now there's a lot of other things, I'm not going to get into all the details that kind of prompted my move away from Word of Truth Baptist Church. And to even consider going anywhere else, there were some other factors involved. But at the end of the day, Word of Truth Baptist Church is, I mean, in Prescott Valley in general, is just really, really not receptive at all. Extremely unreceptive. It's a type of place that I got to the point where I need to shake off the dust of my feet against that area and move on. So when I decided that that was the right thing to do, that I believe that that, that is what, what God wanted me to do. He wanted me to, to move on from there and, and to move on to something else. I started looking at places to start a church. And honestly, the, the reason why, the, my, my, my thinking was, I want to go to a place where I can have the most impact and just do the most for the Lord. Now, one of the best ways to do that, and one of the things that weighed a lot on my decision making was, why not go to an area where there's already a lot of people that are on board doctrinally, that really love God, that want to do a good work, that want to join together and serve God? 
That makes the most sense, right? Why not go to an area where there is a great need and there are a lot of people that are just dying to go out and be sent and be a part of a church where everybody's on board and we're fired up about winning souls of Christ. Why not go to an area like that? And what I did was I waited until after the soul winning mega marathon because all states participated in it. And that gave me a really good idea. I got all the results from Pastor Anderson because he had everyone giving him, you know, how many soul winners showed up, how many people were saved, you know, what was going on. And I know that you guys here didn't realize that. Those of you that participated, you didn't realize that there was someone else waiting and just looking to see the results. When you showed up to that event, you were doing it because you wanted to go win souls. You wanted to participate. You wanted to, have, you know, do something great. But there was someone else out there just watching, waiting to see the results. And when I saw, just, I mean, it was a no-brainer for me to pick this area after I saw the results of that. When I saw how many people showed up to go soul winning on a day where there, where there is no church sending you to go soul winning on that day at all. This was like, the Atlanta area was, I think, and I, I, I may be wrong, but I think it was number one outside of all of the states that had established churches. So Florida, you've got Steadfast Jacksonville, right? Texas, you've got Old Path, you've got Steadfast. You know, Arizona, we had Word of Truth and Faithful Word. You know, California, you got Sacramento and FWCLA, and then you had Vancouver, right? So you have all these areas that have sending churches that had great results, and that makes sense because you have already established churches already with people going and fired up and newness, but Atlanta had, I forget the numbers, I think like 25 people, somewhere right around there, 25, 26 people showed up to go soul winning and about 50 people saved. It's like two per person. Like, to me, that's a no-brainer. But the, fact, the, the most important thing was just like, there was 25 people that showed up just to go soul winning on one day. What about maybe a couple other people that couldn't make it because of the conflict of schedule or whatever? That many people decided to say, you know what, we're going to serve God. We're going to do our best. We're going to come together. We're going we're to do whatever we can to serve the Lord. It made it a very easy decision to come here. I have no other real reason to be here other than that. So when I say that this church exists because of you, and I know many of you here were part of that. I mean that. And for the people that are listening online that, that are, you know, oh man, we want to have a church in our area. Oh, there's no good church. Start doing something now. Do as much as you can without that good church. Do what you possibly can to, to, to get people excited, to motivate people. Get in the best church that you can. Try to get people fired up and get active and get involved. Don't just throw your hands up and be like, oh, well, there's no good church here, so I'm just going to give up. Forget about it. Because if you do that, then you're never going to get anyone out to your area. Because <laughs> there's, there's other people that are training, that are looking, that are just on fire. They want to start a church somewhere. And I guarantee you, many of them are going to be thinking some of the same things I was. Well, I want to be really successful. I want to go somewhere where God can really just use me and maximize what I can do to help Him out. And, and to, to get people saved. And that, that's the goal. And that was one of the reasons why uh, I moved here. Well, this is the main reason why I moved here. So if you're in an area and, and you don't have a good church, and for some reason you can't move, you know, something's keeping you where you're at because there's a lot of people in that type of situation, then just start doing everything you can to bring like-minded believers together. Uh, I thank God for, for Brother John here. He's been a great help getting me out here. He's, he's done a great job of, of kind of keeping up with different people that he's met through other events and things like that and was able to give me a lot of information. And if there's other people out there in other states, you know, start doing that. Start getting organized and pay attention to other people. Go to some of these events, meet people, and get their contact information. Stay in touch with other like-minded believers. And I'm going to show you here from Titus... Uh, that's why we started off in Titus, how you know there were, in the New Testament, churches that existed without pastors. Now, this is not ideal. This is not the way that, that God really wants a church to operate, is just totally not having pastors. But there are, but you got to do what you got to do 
in area, you know, the, ideally you'd go to a church where there's already a pastor, they already, you know, they're preaching right, they've got a, I mean, they've, they're preaching the Word of God, they've got the Bible, you know, they're, they're preaching the right plan of salvation, and they are, um, they're doing some type of evangelism. If you've got that, then keep going to somewhere like that. But if there's nothing, I mean, if there's literally nothing at all that could even fall under that type of criteria, you still don't want to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You want to get around other like-minded believers as much as possible. And um, we see here, before I get ahead of myself, though, the, you know, because the church, what the word church means literally, it's just a congregation. That's what the word means, church. Uh, we get that definition straight from the Bible. Hebrews 2.12 quotes the Old Testament. Hebrews 2.12 says, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Don't have a hard time understanding that, right? You go to church, we sing praise unto God. He says, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Well, that's quoting Psalm 22, verse 22 that says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. So, the word congregation in the Old Testament was translated as church in the New Testament. Same exact verse, same exact meaning. So, obviously, we're meeting right now in a community room. In a government building. <laughs> Imagine that. We're, we're, we're meeting in a government building. And, it's not, and, you know, the church, though, is right here. Strong old Baptist church exists because we are the church. The church is here. It's not this building. Next week, strong old Baptist church is still going to exist. And we're not going to be here. Right? We're going to be meeting in another building. We're going to be meeting outside at the park. It doesn't matter. The church is the people. It's the congregation, right? Well, when you, if you're in an area and, you, and you've got other like-minded believers, start getting a church already together. Maybe you're not qualified to pastor. You haven't been ordained. You haven't set up. That's fine. But get, start getting things rolling, and you're going to be a lot more likely to get a pastor out in your direction a lot sooner. So that's my advice to, to the people online. And we'll see how this plays in here, too. Obviously, it's a little bit different uh, nowadays with, with the, the communication abilities and the, and the Internet and being able to communicate with people. It's, it's awesome. You can do a lot more. And we know that the churches that were started... By the Apostle Paul's, Apostle Paul and other laborers would go out, and Timothy and Titus, and you know, there's various people would go out, Barnabas, you know, they're going out soul winning, they're traveling from town to town, and they're preaching the gospel and getting a lot of people uh, saved, getting a lot of people led to the Lord. And because their mission was to be evangelists, you know, he would go and get people saved, get them gathered together, start teaching them and training them, but then he'd have to move on. So in Paul's travels, you know, obviously it's more important just, to, I mean, to get people saved than to just plant down in one place and stay there forever. His job, his mission was to go out and, and preach to everybody and kind of be more of an evangelist. But we see here in Titus, because Titus was someone who um, studied under the Apostle Paul. He was taught and trained by the Apostle Paul. And he himself was an elder. He was a pastor of a church. And we see here in verse number 5, the Apostle Paul is writing to Titus. He says, For this cause left I thee in Crete. So Apostle Paul moved on, but he said, No, Titus, you stay here. You stay in Crete, because there's things that you need to do here. And he says that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. That word wanting just means it's lacking. It needs something. It's not complete. There are things here that are left undone that need to be taken care of. And that's why I'm leaving you here in Crete, so that you can take care of these things. And he says, And ordain elders in every Every city as I had appointed thee. So every city, there were churches. There were people who, who were saved, people who needed leadership. He says, these churches are lacking. They're wanting. There are people, there are congregations that need leadership. They need elders. They need somebody to lead the flock. And then he goes on and explains all of the, the criteria of who he's supposed to choose. So this is the type of person that you want to be leading in that, in that congregation, in that church. And, and he was to ordain them. But notice, obviously, there's something lacking if there's not a pastor. 
Which is one of the reasons why we don't believe in the, this house church movement where people just all gather together in someone's living room and we're just going to talk about the Bible and you're going to say something and he's going to say something. He's going to say, you know, and everyone's just kind of teaching each other and there's no real leader. There's no, or everybody's a leader, right? Everybody's a pastor. So it's usually one or the other. Usually they don't have anybody who's a leader or a pastor or everybody is. And they don't meet this, this qualification. They weren't ordained. They didn't have hands laid on them. They weren't, you know, they're not qualified to pastor. But it's very clear that these rules are given. You could read that in um, 1 Timothy as well as in Titus. This, this list of things that, that a pastor needs to have in order to be qualified. But we see that, that happening there. No, there's, there's a group of people. These people are saved. They want to serve the Lord. But it's, there's something lacking. They need to have a pastor. And that's what I saw here in, in the Atlanta area. Is that there's a lot of people that are saved. They want to serve God. But there's something lacking. Because there wasn't really a congregation yet, but you could see how much people there were that had some organization together and kind of knew each other. And it only made sense to come here. Now, when I moved to Prescott Valley four and a half years ago, there were no good soul winning churches. I put my time and energy into Word of Truth Baptist Church and that whole area over that time for almost five years now. And one of the things that was lacking there was a proper zeal or interest to do something big for the Lord. And I'm hoping that that's going to be different here. I can see already that I think it is. But overall, one of the things that, that one of the things I've learned and experienced at Word of Truth Baptist Church, because what's what's the point of the sermon? I want to fortify stronghold. I want this to be a strong place. I want people here to be strong Christians and want to serve the Lord. And we're looking for people that want to do the work and that are that are zealous and you want to you want to actually get involved. You want to actually do something. If you want to do something, you're in the right place. Because for two minutes, for too long, there was not a lot of zeal. It seemed like Prescott Valley is a great area. I was talking about this a little bit before service. It's beautiful climate. It's in the mountains. There's lakes. There's lots of outdoors things to do. The demographics are a lot older. It's a place where people go to retire. Now, at first, I didn't think it would be that bad when we started the church there. Because it's very conservative, I thought it would be well received. There actually are quite a few people who are saved that live in Prescott Valley, more than any other area I've been soul winning in. When you go out and knock on doors and you talk to people and they've got a solid testimony of being saved. But no one had a desire to serve God. It's a place that not only did they go to to retire physically, they went to retire spiritually. And it's sad. It's a shame. And there's only so much you can do. You could, you could preach. You could, you know, we went out. I went out, you know, got into all kinds of marketing, online ads. We even had a TV commercial just trying to reach people. Just be like, look, you know, because sometimes people just don't know you exist. You can be in an area and, and there's good-minded people. They want to serve the Lord. They just don't even know about you. We did everything we could to make sure people knew that we were there, that we're in town. But spiritually, it just no one, no one had a zeal. No one was on fire. I have a million things in my mind going on even right now that I want to do and I want to get done. But there's only so much that any one person can do by themselves. There's only so much. There's only so many hours in a day. You've got to work. You've got to take care of family. You've got to, do, you know, when I'm pastoring, there's a lot of things that, that need to be done. And I'm not complaining. There's just, there's just too much stuff to do. But my vision and my goal for, for Stronghold Baptist Church is that we got people here that want to do more. And you've just been waiting to get involved somewhere. You get a little bit of direction and do a lot to serve the Lord. And that is going to help to fortify this church. We want this church to grow. We want to reach, we want to reach the whole Atlanta area, yay, even Georgia. And there's a lot of people here. It's a big job. It's a big task. But you know what? It's not getting done. We need to make sure it gets done. And it's going to require work. It's going to require effort. And you know, a lot of people don't like to hear that. That's not the most popular preaching. People want to come in and hear, oh man, everything's going great. You're doing just fine. Keep it up. And you're not doing anything, right? That, that people want to feel good about things done. But if you're coming here, get used to being challenged. I'm going to make you uncomfortable. 
And hopefully it's not just me. Hopefully the Lord's going to be making you uncomfortable to, to push you a little bit to do more. And I try not to push you over the edge. We're going to get right up close to that because if we want to get a lot of things done, we need to be pushed a little bit. Let's push ourselves. Let's do something. Let's, let's keep a proper vision. What is the goal? What are we doing here? This is not just some social club. We don't want to just come around and you know, I preach about you know, loving the brethren. Amen. That's important. We need to encourage one another. But you know I said? To provoke unto love and to good works. Right? It's not just, hey, we're having a barbecue today and we're going to hang out and just relax and just enjoy everything. We're going to love one another, come in and be like, hey, you coming out soul winning today? Hey, we're going to provoke you to, to do some good works. Hey, did you see this other ministry we got going on? We're going to be going to this rest home. We're going to go into this jail. We're going to be going over here. We're going to be going over there. And we're going to be preaching Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to be doing. And that's, that's how we're going to love each other. We're going to be provoking one another unto love and to good works. Turn if you would to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 18 is what we're going to look at this evening. Verse number 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. I have a vision for this area. There's a lot that I want to get done. And I know that I am not the only one with a vision. I know that there's other people gathered here tonight. Let's work together as fellow laborers and get a great work done for the Lord. What is that vision? We need to be keeping things in the proper perspective. We need a vision. You know, part of that vision is we're going to have a big map. I already have the map. We've got a map of the whole Atlanta area. And we're going to be highlighting and marking off every single door that we knock because the first priority the first works, the first love, is to get the gospel out to the public. Preach the gospel every creature. That is the main focus. If you want to know what the lifeblood is of this church, that is it. That is the single one most important goal is to preach Jesus Christ. That's what we're all about. That's why we're here. That is the main vision. But, you know, there's a lot that goes along with that. I also want this to be a stronghold place, not just for preaching the gospel, but for teaching and training converts, new believers, old believers, everybody to maximize their work for the Lord. We are a church that consists of different members, different members individually. We all have a different role to do. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter number 12. We'll be skipping around in my notes, but it just it makes the most sense to do it this way. Romans chapter 12. This church is also referred to as a body or any church, a local church, an independent church is referred to as a body, as a body of Christ. Is this church. We don't believe in a universal church or a Catholic church. That's what the word Catholic means, by the way, in case you didn't know that. The word Catholic means universal as in this concept that every single believer everywhere is just part of a universal church. Well, we started off demonstrating that the word church means congregation. The reason why there can't be a universal church is because we're not all gathered together in one place. We're not congregated in one area. There is no universal church. There is no Catholic church. We don't believe in that. But you know what that does is it gives people... A lot, uh, you know, a cop out, a way to not get as much stuff done because when you start thinking, oh, well, I'm part of the church just because I'm a believer. Well, then why do you even have to go to church? We go, well, I'm part of the church. I'm part of the universal church. So what's the point? And there, there's many other things that, that happen as a result of such poor, uh, poor teaching from the Bible. But I want, we're going to Romans chapter 12. We're going to see here that, that this body, this church, needs different members. You may be thinking, you know, well, what, what can I do? What can I offer? I want to serve God, but I don't know what to do. There are lots of things to do. And um, there's not just one office. It's not just 
well, there's just a pastor and then church members and then I don't, there's nothing else to do. And the pastor does everything. No, the pastor does not do everything. This is a body that we need all members working in their respective roles together in order to function and, and to be the, the strengthened to, to do our um, utmost capacity. Let's start reading here in verse number four. The Bible says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, Continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. All kinds of attributes and things being listed off there in Romans chapter 12 on how the church is going to function properly and most effectively. So he talks about these different members, right? There's different things that people can do. And he says, well, you've got different gifts there in verse number 6, according to the grace that's given to us. You know, God's given us all different abilities, different things that we can do. He says, maybe you have the gift of being able to prophesy or being able to preach. Maybe you're good at that. Well, you need to be able to be used. And, and, look, and with this church, I'll tell you this right now, too. There's a lot of churches out there that, that don't really get the maximum use out of their members. And they'd much rather have it just be like a one-person show or two-person show or something. I, this church is not going to be like that. Now, there's one pastor that's, that's overseeing the flock and overseeing everything. That is one role or one member that's, that's filling a role there. And that's my job. That job is taken. But there are many other jobs that are open. And I want us all working together. There is going to be plenty of opportunity for people to preach, for other people to do some teaching roles. There's going to be, um, I mean, it says here, let us prophesy according to the importance of faith, or ministry. What is ministry? We went over this morning. Serving others, helping other people out. There's many ways to minister on other people. Ministering on other people in the church. I mean, we just received a great um, gift today by my family. Someone was thoughtful enough to make us some food, knowing that, hey, you're in transition and, and we're able to prepare some meals for us. That's ministry. That's ministering for someone. So you see someone has a need, and what you do, you step up and you fill it. And appreciate that. Thank God for that. But there's other ways, you know, there's, there's many ways to minister. And the more you get to know everyone around you, and get to, I encourage everyone to, if you don't know each other, spend some time before church, spend some time after church, and get to know everybody here. Because that's going to help you to fulfill a role. Maybe, maybe one of your roles, you're going to be very good at ministering, helping other people. You won't know people's needs unless you talk to them. You won't know how you can help someone else without building those relationships. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Again, maybe you're very good at explaining things. There's a role for that. He that exhorteth, or that's on exhortation, encouragement. Right? Saying the right things, a word fitly spoken. Being able to, to, to get that across and help people out. He that giveth, maybe God's blessed you financially. Let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. He's saying have the right heart, have the right attitude. There's a lot of roles that need to be filled. And don't get bitter or upset in any area, especially if God's blessed you a certain way. Use that. Maybe, now this isn't mentioned in the passage, but maybe you're musically talented. I don't know. It didn't seem like where I asked this morning. Maybe we're all musically challenged like I am. But, um, you know, there's going to be roles opening up for leading the singing and, and playing some musical instruments that will accompany. You know, maybe you could do a guitar. Maybe you do a piano. Maybe you do, you know, things like that. That's going to just add to the service and the things that we do here in church. 
Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to see something very similar here about the body and about the different members. So we saw in Romans chapter 12, we saw people, um, you know, if you have a gift of prophecy, you're ministering, teaching, exhorting, exhort, exhortation, uh, ruling. They're all important things that need to be done in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 goes into the different gifts that are given, very similar to Romans 12. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to look at verse number 4. 1 Corinthians 12, verse number 4, the Bible reads, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And pay attention to that. The manifestation of the Spirit that's given to you, because God has given us of His Holy Spirit, it's given to every man to profit with all. God's given at you not just to make you feel good, but to do something with it. God's given everybody abilities and gifts to use, to profit, to do something with it, not just to, to put it aside or set it under a bushel or just... just like we see in the, in the parable where the man, you know, like, oh, here, I, I wrapped up your talent in a napkin. Here, here you go. I'm giving it back to you now. And what did God say about that wicked servant? He said, you're wicked. I wanted you to profit with you. I wanted you to do something with it. Well, God's given you gifts. And I don't know what that is for you, but, but you should know. If you don't know, start getting involved in different things until you find what, what you're, you're good at, what you're apt for. And don't worry, there's, a, there's, as I mentioned, there's, a, there's plenty of things that we can do. Maybe you're good with, with editing videos. There's a lot of videos that I'd like to make that's teaching resources. There's a lot of pamphlets that I'd like to make literature that's spelled out to, to teach with, you know, on, on very simple doctrines like baptism and, you know, all, just all kinds of different things, soul winning. Maybe you're very organized and you've got some really good skills with keeping track of all the work that we're doing, going out and knocking on doors, presenting information, preparing. So, you know, there's so many different things that can be done. You just have to start thinking about what is going to help us get the job done without abandoning biblical methods. We have to stay true to God's methods, but we can always add on that and do anything that will help. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about, specifically with soul winning, we're not just going to print out, you know, in, in the desire to just reach as many people as possible, we're not just going to print off a bunch of pamphlets and just like litter them down from an airplane or something or just, just go out and just, not, uh, and just hang door hangers. Right? You, you may say, oh, but we can reach the, mo reach the most people that way. Well, but now you're doing it in a way that, that God didn't say. It's not actual soul winning. That's just, just information distribution. Now, at some point, there may be a, a purpose for information distribution, right? But then we'll probably hire someone to just go out and do that. You know, we'll send it off in the mail or something. We're, we have the mailman deliver the things to the doors, and we'll still keep doing uh, our soul winning and things like that. But there, there may be a time for that. I know at Word of Truth Baptist Church, I was doing a newsletter for a while to keep people up to date on things that are going on in the church that weren't local, that maybe couldn't attend, or maybe they were local and they haven't been to church in a while. There's things like that. Those are good things to keep people in. It's not the primary focus, but it's something that was being done. There's a lot of work that could be done. There's a lot of ministry. There's a lot of areas where we can be helping people out, keeping people in, keeping people involved. And I'm sure that there are people here that will have gifts to help in all of those various areas. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, let's, keep, let's pick up reading where we left off here. Um, verse number 8, the Bible says, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one in the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. 
For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. We need to keep that in mind. And just as God has given everybody different talents and different abilities, don't ever get bitter or upset with what your talent and ability is. And the analogy he's given here is a physical, literal body. Our body is made up of different members, right? You have hands and nose and ears and eyes and all these different members that all make up one body. And they all perform a different function. They all have different value. My nose is really good at smelling. Well, maybe not that good, but it's, it's good enough, right? That's the job that it performs. And some of my senses, some of my members are better at their job than others, right? My vision, for example, is, is pretty good. My hearing, not that good. But the ear is doing the job of the hearing, right? We get it. And what he's saying here is, well, what if the eye were to say, well, I mean, I can't hear anything, I'm not the ear, so I'm not even part of the body. That's ridiculous. Of course you're part of the body. The eye is very necessary, just as much as the ear is necessary, just as much as the nose. You know, everybody has their own role, and, and every member has its own function. And our, our physical bodies work the best when all of the members are functioning, doing what they're supposed to do. I don't need my ears to see. I have my eyes for that. But I do need them to hear. They're going to help me out tremendously. And I can do that much more work, just physically speaking, if everything is functioning properly within my body, the way that God put it in order. And it's the same thing within the church. Don't say, well, because I'm not the pastor, then, I mean, what does it even matter? There's nothing I can do. No, God has placed you in this church. God has given you your talent, your ability, whatever it is that he wants you to do and you're here as a member and we want everybody being involved and everybody being active doing whatever it is that you can do and when everybody's in their place when everybody's functioning doing different tasks different things then this church is going to be very strong and very solid and able to get the most things done but don't get upset about wherever, whatever talents God's giving you. Use it, rather, to, bring, to, to do that much more for the Lord. And just, and just understand that if that's the way that God made you, those are the gifts that God's given you, then He wants you to do that. You don't need to worry about the glory or you know, whatever. Do, do what you can do, but get involved. The Bible says, we'll continue on here. Verse number 18, we'll reread that. But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. So people are where they're supposed to be, or the members are where they should be, based on what, God, what pleases God. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the, feet, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. We all care about one another. Every member of the body is important. We shouldn't be looking down on one person or exalting one another too much because of their role or whatever they have. The Bible is explaining here that oftentimes the, 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 the members that seem to be less honorable are actually really, really important. 
And those that, that may aesthetically look really attractive, the Bible uses like hair, like, oh yeah, hair looks real beautiful. There's not a lot of value to that. But he uses things and uses people that have these gifts and these talents. Um, sometimes it's not going to be very glorifying. It's not going to be, uh, you're not going to get maybe a lot of credit for it. But don't be discouraged in that. Just do what it is that you need to get done. Um, this is how we are collectively going to get things get uh, done to get the most done as possible. Now turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 47. So everyone has a role. And, and my role, one of my roles here is to help you to find that role and utilize and, and make sure the body, you know, try to keep the body functioning as properly, as best as possible. Now, there are a lot of critical jobs that may not get a lot of credit. I think about, think about all the work that was done. We read a lot of highlights in Scripture. For example, the day of Pentecost. It's a very highlight. I mean, you had thousands of people saved and baptized, and what a great, phenomenal day that was. But we don't really hear a lot about everyone else that was doing the work. We, we hear about Peter, right? Because Peter does some of the preaching in Acts chapter 2. We hear about a few individuals that are very key, very important, very, very highlighted as far as, you know, where the attention is going. But I'll tell you what, in order for all that work to be done, in order for that many souls to be saved, there was a lot more than just Peter preaching that day. There was a lot of people. I mean, there was 120 people. We don't even know all their names. But they all participated in getting such a great work done. And they were all important, very important and very valuable and very needed. You may not get all the recognition, the credit. I mean, even look at all 12 of Jesus' disciples. You don't hear that much about all of them. We hear about a few. They're the ones that seem to be in a position, you know, this glory and honor where, where you hear a lot about them. But you know what? They were all important. They were all filling a role. Jesus wouldn't have picked them to be with them if he didn't have a specific job for them to do. And the best thing for them to do was to be doing what Jesus wanted them to do. Even if people, and you know what? I believe that God is, has greatly rewarded these people that you might never know the name of until you get to heaven. But they're just, they've got their head down, they're doing their work, they're, do, they're making the best with what God has given unto them. Whether God's given them one talent or two talents or five talents or ten talents, whatever they have to do, if you are going to use that for the Lord, then He is going to bless you and reward you for that. Now, Genesis chapter 47. Why do we go to Genesis chapter 47? Well, there's a story here where the children of Israel came into Egypt. This is where Joseph was kind of in charge of the land before, you know, as a famine was going on and the children of Israel came into the land and Pharaoh was looking for someone to help take care of his stuff, take care of his cattle, because he knew that Joseph's brethren were, um, you know, herdmen and they had handled cattle and things like that. And verse number five there, Genesis 47, it says, And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee, and the best of the land make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. And what I'm looking for tonight, and what this church needs, is men of activity. We need people who want to be active, who want to do things. And when you prove yourself, and see, it's, it's not just signing up for, hey, I want to be the leader, but you have nothing at all to establish that you can even do that job. That's not the way things work um, in life and in the Bible. We see here, he's saying, do you know, already know of men who are just really, who work hard? They're men of activity. They don't just sit around. They're not lazy. They're doing things. They're getting things done. Those are the people that I want in charge of my stuff. See, you, these people should have been working and working and working for years and established themselves. Hey, I'm a hard worker. I'm a man of activity. 
And then this opportunity arises, and Pharaoh's like, yeah, that's the person I want in charge of all my stuff. And you get a promotion, as it were. And that's when you get exalted. But it comes after, that, uh, that type of honor only comes after you're willing to work hard and to make the sacrifices that are necessary. We need people here to be working hard. And, and willing to put in the extra time. The Bible says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Turn if you would to Acts chapter 17. It's the last place we're going to close on Acts chapter 17. The great works, the great honor, it'll come. God will bless you for your work, but we need to make sacrifices as well. Need to make sacrifice. I had someone, I had people, very a lot of people contacting me with a new church and things like that. And it's it's always interesting to see where where people are at, just in their mind or in their faith. And you know, I'm not I'm not trying to call anyone out specifically, so I'm gonna be very generic in this because it's not about the person, it's about the mindset. We have people asking, like, oh, well, where are you going to be located? And I tell them, we're, you know, we'll be meeting here. And it's like, oh, well, that's like, you know, 30 minutes from me or something. As if, like, and, and I don't know if they're expecting me to say, oh, well, we'll move it closer to you or something like that. I don't know. But it's like, well, yeah, it was about three days for me <laughs> to get there. And there's people traveling from out of state. And, you know, this is something that, that people are really excited about and, and want to serve the Lord. And if it happens to be 30 minutes away or 40 minutes away, so be it. That's fine for them. Why? Because they, they have decided that they're willing to make sacrifice to be in the best place that they could be and serve the Lord to the, to the utmost of their potential. And we need to have that type of a mindset. You know, you may need to sacrifice, for example, your day of rest to do the work that God has for you. You know, a lot of people want to, and look, in the flesh, I do too. It's Sunday, it's Sunday afternoon. I want to just, you know, I've been working all week. I want to lay down. I want to take a nap. I'm tired. But then the Spirit's saying, Let's go soul winning. Let's go do something. Let, let's keep pushing forward. We got to do this. Now, again, I don't want to I don't want to run you into the ground and just and just destroy you because you're working so much you never get any rest. That's not the point. But if we're honest with ourselves, look, there there are times to, to make the sacrifice. And usually it's probably more often than not where we have the ability to say, you know what, I'm going to keep pushing. I can keep doing some more. Acts chapter 17, we're going to get a really good insight into the Apostle Paul. I mean, you want to talk about, if we're going to model after people, obviously Jesus Christ first and foremost. But what about the Apostle Paul? What a great example he was. Talk about someone who got a lot of things done for the Lord. Do you want to get a lot of things done for the Lord? I do. Well, let's look at some good examples here. Let's see who we could model after and say, if he can do it, so can I. You know, you might look at Jesus Christ and be like, he's the son of God. Of course he was able to do it. I can't do that because I'm not the son of God. What about the Apostle Paul? He is a man. Flesh and blood. You and me. Literally, there is no difference. There should be no difference in what someone like that can do and what someone like you can do. You know, I've told this story before. The book of Acts is my favorite book of the Bible. Even just the name Acts, what does it mean? It's action. People are doing something. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of excitement. Man, I've always loved that book. And I remember, and I, you know, I've, I've told this story in other sermons before, but the first time I, when I, when I was very, very new at Faithful Word Baptist Church, I was explaining to Pastor Anderson, we were just talking, kind of chatting after church, and I was just like, man, I love the book of Acts. Same exact reason. I love it. It's great. But back then, my mindset was just like, oh, well, I just love it because, look, they did all this great work. I'm like, wouldn't it be great to live in that time and to do those, you know, to be part of that and to do all those things as if it's just completely impossible to serve the Lord or to have Christianity be exciting? 
right? It was just kind of the way I was thinking. I was like, I loved it. I love reading about it. I was like, man, I wish, you know, I wish it could be like that again now. He's like, well, why can't it be? Why can't it be? Why can't it be exciting? Who is it that's limiting God? Do you, think, do you think God's different? Do you think God's like, well, I only want there to be a lot of work being done for me now in this time period and not anymore after that. No, it's ridiculous. Of course God, God we're the ones that's going to limit him if anything. God is seeking, I believe continually, for someone who is willing, someone who is willing-hearted to say, God, I'm here, I want to serve you, whatever it takes, I'll do it. He's looking for that. But he's looking for people who are genuine and real and not saying it with their lips, but their heart is far from it. Why? Because there is sacrifice involved. It is work. It is not easy. If you want to do a great thing for the Lord, you're going to, have to, you're going to go through a lot. You're going to suffer a lot. There's a cost involved. Is your heart right? Is your heart ready? Are you willing to take on the challenge? Are you willing to pay the price to get a lot done? What happened this afternoon, I believe, is, is nothing. I'm referring to the, the car getting broken into compared to the attacks and the troubles and the trials that we as a church will be facing and individually be facing if you decide that you are sold out for serving God and that you are going to do the most and yield yourself up to God and you're willing to pay and you're willing to sacrifice, there is going to be a lot more coming our way, a lot more heat, a lot more pressure, a lot, a lot more of that. That's just the tip of the iceberg. That's part of the cost. It's part of the sacrifice. You have family members that aren't going to want to have anything to do with you. They're going to try to get you to get out of the church. They're going to tell you you're part of a cult. They're going to, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. You probably already experienced some of that already. I know we have. It's nothing new. But again, that's another reason why we come together to encourage one another, to provoke one another into love and a good work to let you know, hey, what you're experiencing. We've, we've been there. I've done it. You know, stay with it. Stay the course. Stay true to the Lord. It'll work itself out. It's a trial. It's going to work patience. You're going you're to be able to go through this stuff, and then the next time you go through it, it's going to be a lot easier to handle because you've already done it once. Let's look at Paul's attitude in Acts chapter 17. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. Look at verse number two. I'm going to highlight this. And Paul, as his manner was. So this is just who Paul is. It's just Paul's manner. He's like, you know, they're over there. They're in Thessalonica. There's a synagogue over there. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. You know what his manner is? It means that's his habit. That's just what he does. That's, oh, of course, there's the Apostle Paul. What's he doing? He's going and preaching the Jews again, trying to get them saved. He's taking his Sabbath day. He's taking his day of rest, and he's going into the synagogue, and he's going to try to get people saved. And you know what? That was just indicative of the Apostle Paul. That was just who he was. Now, we have soul winning times. Right now, we have one. And I encourage everyone to, to make it a point to go out and go soul winning. But our goal is, what we want to be, what, what, where you want to end up is, yes, to attend the soul winning times, but where it could be said about you, you know, as his manner was, yeah, he's just preaching the gospel to people. He's taking his time, he's taking his Saturdays, and he's just going and preaching the gospel. Well, there he goes again. There goes brother so-and-so, he's, he's preaching the gospel again. That's just what he does. That's who he is. That's who the Apostle Paul was, and look at how much he got done. It's a lot. That's where his heart is. Verse number 3. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. Apostle Paul really started to have an impact in this area because he didn't let himself get lazy. 
Even when he's waiting around, he's waiting around for some of his friends. You know what he does? When he's in Athens, he's, he's waiting around for Timothy. You know, he went a different way. He got there before everyone else, and he's waiting for, for his fellow laborers to come and join him. And his soul stirred within him. He sees all the idolatry. He's just like, I can't just sit around and wait. He needs to go and do something about it. He starts preaching. No one else is there with him. He's just like, I got I to gotta say something about this. We want to have that type of a spirit. And look, it may, you may be like, oh, I don't, I'm not like that at all. Well, that's why we're here. Let's work on that. Let's have the vision. Let's have the mindset of saying, I do want to be like the Apostle Paul. I understand it's going to cost me something. And you know, things like that don't just happen overnight to where all of a sudden, hey, my manner is just, I'm going to go out and just preach the gospel to every single person I ever run across in my life. I'd like to get there. You might not even be able to see now how you can be there, but what you do is you, you keep coming. You keep doing a little bit more. Just add to it. Do what you can do. Keep adding. Keep growing. Keep moving forward. You'll get there. It doesn't happen overnight. Just remember that. But don't let that become an excuse to just not do anything. Right? We, we want to get the right balance. You want to keep growing and keep pushing forward and keep sacrificing to do more. Verse number 5, Acts 17, 5. But the Jews which believe not moved with envy took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city at an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Now, the Apostle Paul, he's going into the synagogue, he's preaching. Three Sabbath days, he's going in, he's preaching, he's trying to teach them, look, Jesus is Christ. This is the Messiah. This is who you've been waiting for. He's trying to get people saved. He's trying to lead people to Christ. And verse 4 says that some of them believed. He's making, he's, he's getting the work done. He's persuading people to become Christians, to put their faith in Christ. He's actually doing something, doing something positive. And what happens as a result of that? Well, the Jews which believe not... They're envious of them, and what do they do? They start bringing an attack. And that's what I'm talking about. You know, if we're going to start doing real work for God and persuading people and going out and reaching the lost and convincing people, and the more people we're impacting, and the more people that have a manner like Paul's manner was, well, guess what? Those that don't believe, they're going to take notice of that. And they're going to come and try to attack. And they're going to come and get the, the lewd fellows of the base. Base means low. It means they're just the, these low lives. Just gathering together these low lives to come against them and assault the house of Jason. Look at verse number 6. And when they found them not, because they're seeking the Apostle Paul, they're seeking you know, all the disciples, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rules of the city, crying. Look at what they cried. These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. They said, they're ruining everything. These Christians coming and preaching Christ and preaching that they shouldn't be living in sin and preaching you know, all this stuff. They're turning the world upside down. They've gone and turned the world upside down everywhere else, and now they're come here. Well, guess what, Atlanta? Those that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. And we got a group of people that are not going to back down. And that the good doctrine of the good word. And the salvation through Jesus Christ alone is going to be preached here. And no one's going to stop it. The only people that can stop this work is you. It's you. If you're going to do the work for the Lord, the Lord's going to be with you. Guaranteed. There is nothing that can stop the spread of the gospel but you. You could read through everything the Apostle Paul went through. How many times he was stoned to death? How many times he was shipwrecked? How many times he was beaten and thrown in prison? And everything that was done against him to get him to shut up and to stop doing his work. But he continued. And God made it possible. Miraculously sometimes. But he wouldn't give up. We're not giving up. 
This is Stronghold Baptist Church. We are a stronghold. We are going to be a stronghold. We are going to be a stronghold for the truth and for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man, I'm excited. I don't know if I told you that before or not. I am excited. This is just the start to something that's going to be awesome. Join me in my zeal. You, you know what? Maybe you have more zeal than I do. I hope so. Let's get a lot of things done. Let's grow. Let's work. There's, there's so much to be done. So many people to reach. Let's join together in a unity of faith and, and keep our vision on things in heaven. Not on things on this earth. Let's, let's, let's treat the, the little setbacks and the, and the annoyances and the, the attacks and just view that as, as temporary, because they are. And stay committed and stay focused and don't let the, the, any of the attacks, any personal problems get in the way. Don't quit. Inspire Reds, I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this group of people that are here. I thank you for bringing us all together into this place, Lord, that you know, we all have different backgrounds and live in different areas. And um, I pray that you would please just strengthen this church, help us to really do a great work for you. We want Jesus Christ to just be magnified and exalted through all of this. Lord, help us to have the right spirit. I pray that you would please help us to strengthen and encourage one another and that you would comfort us through the Holy Ghost as we endeavor to do this great work. Lord, we know that it's not an easy path. We know that it's not the path that most people take, but Lord, we're, we're on this journey. We're pilgrims here on this earth. We're passing through. We've got a home in heaven and we're trying to lay up as many treasures as we can in heaven as opposed to on earth. Lord, we just ask for your blessing upon our church. Help us to reach many people. Lord, work in the hearts and the minds of all those that we come into contact with, with your word. Dear Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.